From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Saturday morning session of the 185th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers are selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Members and officers of the church gather from all areas of the world to receive counsel and instruction from their church leaders. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, First Counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday morning session of the 185th Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As we open this session of conference, we note the passing of President Boyd K. Packer, Elder L. Tom Perry, and most recently, Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We miss them. Each of these brethren gave his all in the service of the Lord and is undoubtedly engaged in this great work on the other side of the veil. We express our love and heartfelt condolences to the Packer, Perry, and Scott families. You are in our prayers. This morning, we welcome and acknowledge the general authorities and the general officers who will be in attendance throughout the conference and likewise express gratitude to members and friends participating in the conference throughout the world. The music for this session will be by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy with Clay Christiansen at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with Press Forward Saints and will now favor us with Guide us, O Thou Great Jehovah. The invocation will then be offered by Sister Mary R. Durham, second counselor in the primary general presidency, after which the choir will sing, I know that my Savior loves me.
Our dear, kind Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be gathered this day all over the world as we strive to be true followers of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, who shows us the way, the truth, and the light. We are so grateful for our prophet, Thomas S. Monson. We pray that our hearts and our minds will be open at the, to the Holy Ghost that will teach us all things that we must know and do. We pray that we will be united as one to take the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world, that all may receive their ordinances and covenants that lead us back to Thee. We say these things most humbly. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, Second Counselor in the First Presidency. He will be followed by Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Elder Richard J. Maines of the Presidency of the Seventy will then address us. My beloved brothers and sisters, my dear friends, it's a joy to be with you today. We're saddened by the sight of three empty places here on the stand. We do miss President Packer, Elder Perry, and Elder Scott. We love them, and we pray for their well-being of their families. During this conference weekend, we will be privileged to sustain three who have been called by the Lord to take their place among the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Your prayers, our prayers on their behalf will strengthen them as they bear the sacred mantle of apostleship. Not long ago, I saw a quote that made me stop and think. It went like this. Tell a man there are trillions of stars in the universe and he'll believe you. Tell him there's wet paint on the wall and he'll touch it just to be sure. <laughs> Aren't we all a little bit like this? After a recent medical procedure, my very capable doctors explained what I needed to do to heal properly. But first, I had to relearn something about myself I should have known for a long time. As a patient, I'm not very patient. Consequently, I decided to expedite the healing process by undertaking my own internet search. <laughs> I suppose I expected to discover truth of which my doctors were unaware or had tried to keep from me. It took me a little while before I realized the irony of what I was doing. Of course, researching these things for ourselves is not a bad idea, but I was disregarding truth I could rely on and instead found myself being drawn to the often outlandish claims of Internet lore. Sometimes the truth may just seem too straightforward, too plain, and too simple for us to fully appreciate its great value. So we set aside what we have experienced and know to be true in pursuit of more mysterious or complicated information. Hopefully, we will learn quickly that when we chase after shadows, we are pursuing matters that have little substance and value. When it comes to spiritual truth, how can we know that we are on the right path? One way is by asking the right questions, the kind that help us ponder our progress and evaluate how things are working for us. Questions like, does my life have meaning? Do I believe in God? Do I believe that God knows and loves me? Do I believe that God hears and answers my prayers? Am I truly happy? Are my efforts leading me to the highest spiritual goals and values in life? Profound questions regarding the purpose of life have led many individuals and families throughout the world to search for truth. Often that search has led them to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and to the restored gospel. I wonder if we, as church members, might also benefit from asking ourselves from time to time, 
Is my experience in the church working for me? Is it bringing me closer to Christ? Is it blessing me and my family with peace and joy as promised in the gospel? Alma posed similar questions to the church members in Zarahemla when he asked, have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts and can you feel it now? Such contemplation may help us to refocus or realign our daily efforts with the divine plan of salvation. Many members will answer with great warmth that their experience as a member of the church is working exceptionally well for them. They will testify that whether during times of poverty or prosperity, whether things are pleasant or painful, they find great meaning, peace, and joy because of their commitment to the Lord and their dedicated service in the church. Every day I meet church members who are filled with a radiant joy and who demonstrate in word and in deed that their lives are immeasurable enriched by the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. But I also recognize that there are some who have a less than fulfilling experience who feel that their membership in the church sometimes isn't quite what they had hoped for. This saddens me because I know firsthand how the gospel can invigorate and renew one's spirit, how it can fill our hearts with hope and our minds with light. I know for myself how the fruits of the gospel of Jesus Christ can transform lives from the ordinary and dreary to the extraordinary and sublime. But why does it seem to work better for some than for others? What is the difference between those whose experience and the church fills their souls with songs of redeeming love and those who feel something is lacking? As I have pondered these questions, a flood of thoughts came to mind. Today, I'd like to share two. First, are we making our discipleship too complicated? This beautiful gospel is so simple a child can grasp it, yet so profound and complex that it will take a lifetime even an eternity of study and discovery to fully understand it. But sometimes we take the beautiful lily of God's truth and gild it with layers upon layers of man-made good ideas, programs, and expectations. Each one by itself might be helpful and appropriate for a certain time and circumstance. But when they are laid on top of each other, they can create a mountain of sediment that becomes so thick and heavy that we risk losing sight of that precious flower we once loved so dearly. Therefore, as leaders, we must strictly protect the church and the gospel in its purity and plainness and avoid putting unnecessary burdens on our members. And all of us, as members of the church, we need to make a conscientious effort to devote our energy and time to the things that truly matter while uplifting our fellow man and building the kingdom of God. One lovely sister, a Relief Society instructor, was known for preparing flawless lessons. One time, she decided to create a beautiful quilt that would serve as the perfect backdrop to the theme of her lesson. But life intervened. There were children to pick up from school, a neighbor who needed help moving, 
a husband with a fever, and a friend who felt lonely. So the day of the lesson approached, and the quilt was not completed. Finally, the night before the, her lesson, she did not sleep much as she worked all night on the quilt. The next day, she was exhausted and barely able to organize her thoughts, but she bravely stood and delivered her perfect lesson. And the quilt was stunning. The stitches were perfect, the colors vibrant, and the sign intricate. And at the center of it all was a single word that triumphantly echoed the theme of her lesson. Simplify. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, living the gospel doesn't need to be complicated. It is really straightforward. It could be described like this. Hearing the word of God with earnest intent leads us to believe in God and to trust his promises. The more we trust God, the more our hearts are filled with love for him and for each other. Because of our love for God, we desire to follow him and bring our actions in alignment with his word. Because we love God, we want to serve him. We want to bless the lives of others and help the poor and the needy. The more we walk in this path of discipleship, the more we desire to learn the word of God. And so it goes, each step leading to the next and filling us with ever increasing faith, hope, and charity. It is beautifully simple, and it works beautiful. Brothers and sisters, if you ever think that the gospel isn't working so well for you, I invite you to step back, look at your life from a higher plane, and simplify your approach to discipleship. Focus on the basic doctrines, principles, and applications of the gospel. I promise that God will guide and bless you on your path to a fulfilling life, and the gospel will definitely work better for you. My second suggestion is start where you are. Sometimes we feel discouraged because we are not more of something, more spiritual, more respected, more intelligent, healthy, more rich, more friendly, or capable. Naturally, there is nothing wrong with wanting to improve. God created us to grow and progress. But remember, our weaknesses can help us to be humble and turn us to Christ, who will make weak things become strong. Satan, on the other hand, uses our weaknesses to the point that we're discouraged from even trying. I learned in my life that we don't need to be more of anything to start to become the person God intended us to become. God will take you as you are at this very moment and begin to work with you as you need and all you need is really a willing heart, a desire to believe, and trust in the Lord. Gideon saw himself as a poor farmer, the least of his father's house, but God saw him as a mighty man of valor. When Samuel chose Saul, to be king, Saul tried to talk him out of it. Saul was from one of the smallest tribes of the house of Israel. How could he be king? But God saw him as a choice young man. Even the great prophet Moses felt so overwhelmed and discouraged at one point that he wanted to give up and die. But God did not give up on Moses. My dear brothers and sisters, if we look at us only through our mortal eyes, we may not see ourselves as good enough. But our Heavenly Father sees us as who we truly are, 
and who we can become. He sees us as his sons and daughters, as beings of eternal light with an everlasting potential and with a divine destiny. The Savior's sacrifice opened the door of salvation for all to return to God. His grace is sufficient for all who humble themselves before God. His grace is the enabling power that allows access into God's kingdoms of salvation. Because of his grace, we will all be resurrected and saved in a kingdom of glory. Even the lowest kingdom of glory, the celestial kingdom, surpasses all understanding and numberless people will inherit this salvation. But the Savior's grace can do much more for us. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we aspire to something unimaginable greater. It is exaltation in the celestial kingdom. <clears throat> it is life eternal in the presence of our Father in heaven. It is the greatest gift of God. In the celestial kingdom, we receive of his fullness and of, and of his glory. Indeed, all that the Father hath shall be given unto us. Exaltation is our goal. Discipleship is our journey. As you exercise a little faith and begin your walk as a peaceable follower of our Lord Jesus Christ, your heart will change. Your whole being will be filled with light. God will, will help you become something greater than you ever thought possible. And you will discover that the gospel of Jesus Christ is indeed working in your life. It works. Brothers and sisters, dear friends, I pray that we will focus on the simplicity that is in Christ and allow his grace to lift and carry us during our journey from here, from where we are right now, to our glorious destiny in our Father's presence. As we do so, and someone will ask us, how is being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints working for you? We will be able to say with pride and in all humility and with great joy, it works. It works wonderfully. Thank you for asking. Would you like to know more? This is my hope my prayer, my testimony, and my blessing, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last general conference in October, uh, I invited the listeners to uh, follow Brigham Young's counsel and stay on the old ship Zion which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and to hold on with both hands. Since then, I'm happy to know that some of my family and others were listening and have asked me this question, what's in the old ship Zion that we should hang on to? I reminded them of what President Young said, we're on the old ship Zion, God is at the helm and will stay there. He dictates, guides, and directs. If the people will have implicit confidence in their God, never forsake their covenants, nor their God, he will guide us right. Clearly, our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ have outfitted the old ship Zion with clear and simple eternal truths that will help us stay the course through the troubled waters of mortal life. Here are just a few. The Church of Jesus Christ has always been led by living prophets and apostles. Though mortal and subject to human imperfection, 
The Lord's servants are inspired to help us avoid obstacles that are spiritually life-threatening and to help us pass safely through mortality to our final, ultimate, heavenly destination. During my nearly 40 years of close association, I have been a personal witness as both quiet inspiration and profound revelation have moved to action the prophets and apostles, the general authorities, and the auxiliary leaders. While neither perfect nor infallible, these good men and women have been perfectly dedicated to leading the work of the Lord forward as He has directed. And make no mistake about it, the Lord directs His Church through living prophets and apostles. This is the way He has always done His work. Indeed, the Savior taught, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. We cannot separate Christ from his, his servants. Without His first apostles, we would not have an eyewitness account of many of His teachings, His ministry, His suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, and His death on the cross. Without their testimonies, we would not have an apostolic witness of the empty tomb and the resurrection. He commanded those first apostles, Go ye, therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This commission has been renewed in our own day with the Lord when the Lord called Joseph Smith to restore the Church with ordained apostles to declare His gospel one last time before He will come again. It has always been a challenge for the world to accept living prophets and apostles, but it is so essential to do so in order to fully understand the Atonement and the teachings of Jesus Christ and to, to receive a fullness of the blessings of the priesthood that follow those He has called. Too many people think Church leaders and members should be perfect or nearly perfect. They forget that the Lord's grace is sufficient to accomplish His work through mortals. Our leaders have the best intentions, but sometimes we make mistakes. This is not unique to church leadership or relationships, as the same thing occurs in our relationships among friends, neighbors, and workplace associates, and even between spouses and in families. Looking for human weakness in others is rather easy. However, we make a serious mistake by noticing only the human nature of one another and then failing to see God's hand working through those He has called. Focusing on how the Lord inspires His chosen leaders and how He moves the saints to do remarkable and extraordinary things despite their humanity is one way that we hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ and stay safely aboard the old ship Zion. The second truth is the doctrine of the plan of salvation. Through the prophet Joseph Smith, God gave the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and many additional teachings to the Church. These include a knowledge of the plan of salvation, which is a map of where we came from, our purpose here on earth, and where we are going when we die. The plan also provides us with a unique eternal perspective that we are God's spirit children. By understanding who our Heavenly Father is and our relationship to Him and to His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we will accept their commandments and make covenants with them that will lead us back into their eternal presence. 
Every time I hold a newborn child, I find myself wondering, who are you, little one? What will become you become through the atonement of Christ? We ask similar reflective questions when someone we love dies. Where are they? What are they seeing and experiencing? Does life continue? What will be the nature of our most cherished relationships in the great world of the spirits of the dead? In that world, our family has two granddaughters, Sarah and Emily, and a grandson, Nathan. With each child's passing, we as a family held on to the gospel truths with both hands. Our questions were answered with comfort and assurance through the atonement of the Savior. Although we miss our grandchildren, we know they live and we know we will see them again. How grateful we are for this spiritual understanding in times of personal and familial turbulence. Another key truth in the Church is that Heavenly Father created Adam and Eve for a lofty purpose. It was their charge and subsequently the charge of their posterity to create mortal bodies for God's spirit children so they could experience mortality. By this process, Heavenly Father sends His spirit children to earth to learn and grow through the experiences of earth life. Because He loves His children, God sends heavenly messengers and apostles to teach them about Christ's central role as our Savior. Through the centuries, prophets have fulfilled their duties when they have warned people of the dangers before them. The Lord's apostles are duty-bound to watch, warn, and reach out to help those seeking answers to life's questions. Twenty years ago, the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles issued the family a proclamation to the world. In that inspired document, we concluded with just the following words. We warn that individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God. Further, we warn that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. The apostles, as apostles today, we reaffirm this solemn warning. Please remember that commandments and covenants are priceless truths and doctrines found in the old ship Zion, where God is at the helm. Another important doctrine that we should cling to is to observe the Sabbath day. This helps us remain unspotted from the world, provides us with physical rest, and gives each of us the spiritual refreshment of worshiping the Father and the Son every Sunday. When we delight in the Sabbath day, it is a sign of our love for them. As part of our efforts to make the Sabbath a delight, we have asked local leaders and church members to remember that sacrament meeting is the Lord's and should be rooted and grounded in His teachings. The presentation of the ordinance of the sacrament is when we renew our covenants and reconfirm our love for the Savior and remember His sacrifice and His atonement. This same spirit of worship should permeate our monthly fast and testimony meetings. This sacrament meeting is for members to briefly express gratitude, love, and appreciation for our Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ and the restored gospel, and to bear personal witness of these things. Fast and testimony meeting is a time to share brief inspirational thoughts and bear solemn testimony. It is not a time to give a speech. 
Young children should practice sharing their testimonies in primary and with their parents in family home evening uh, until they understand the important meaning of a testimony. The recent, recent emphasis of making the Sabbath a delight is a direct result of inspiration of, from the Lord through the leaders of the church. Ward council members should assist the bishoprics several weeks in advance by reviewing music and topics that have been recommended for each sacrament meeting. All of us are blessed when the Sabbath is filled with love for the Lord at home and at church. When our children are taught in the ways of the Lord, they learn to feel and to respond to His Spirit. We will all desire to attend each Sunday to partake of the sacrament when we feel the Spirit of the Lord. And all young and old who are carrying heavy burdens will feel the spiritual uplift and comfort that comes from Sabbath day of devoted contemplation of our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfully, Christ is always near, waiting and willing to help us when we pray for help and are willing to repent and come unto Him. Now, as we ponder just these few truths that exist within the old ship Zion, let us stay on board and remember that by definition, a ship is a vehicle, that the purpose of a vehicle is to take us to a destination. Our ship's destination is the full blessings of the gospel, the kingdom of heaven, the celestial glory, and the presence of God. God's plan is in place. He is at the helm, and His great and powerful ship flows towards salvation and exaltation. Remember, we cannot reach there by jumping out of the boat and trying to swim there by ourselves. Exaltation is the goal of this mortal journey, and no one gets there without the means of the gospel of Jesus Christ, His atonement, the ordinances, and the guiding doctrine and principles that are found in the Church. It is the Church wherein we learn the works of God and accept the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. It is within the Church that we form commitments and covenants of eternal families and become our, that become our passport to exaltation. It is the Church that is powered by the priesthood to propel us through the unpredictable waters of mortality. Let us be grateful for the beautiful old ship Zion, for without it we are cast adrift, alone and powerless, swept along without rudder or oar, swirling with the strong currents of the adversary's wind and waves. Hold tight, brothers and sisters. Sail on within the glorious ship, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and we will reach our eternal destination. This is my testimony and prayer for all of us. In the name of He for whom the old ship Zion is named, even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The world in which we live is putting great pressure on good people everywhere to lower or even abandon their standards of righteous living. However, despite the evils and temptations that surround us each day, we can and will find true joy today in living a Christ-centered life. Centering our lives in Jesus Christ and His gospel will bring stability and happiness to our lives as the following examples illustrate. Elder Taichi Aoba of the 70, who resides in a small mountain village in Shikoku, Japan, was asked to teach a class at a youth conference. 
Stand Ye in Holy Places was selected as the theme of the conference. After considering the theme and what to teach, Elder Oba decided to use his vocation as a teaching tool. His work is making pottery. Elder Oba relates that his classroom of youth really sprang to life when they saw how he was able to almost magically transform the shape of the clay in his hands to plates, bowls, and cups. After his demonstration, he asked them if any of them would like to give it a try. They all raised their hands. Elder Oba had several of the youth come forward to try out their new interest. They assumed after watching him that this would be quite simple. However, none of them were successful in their attempts to make even a simple bowl. They proclaimed, I can't do this. Why is this so hard? This is so difficult. These comments took place as the clay flew all around the room. He asked the youth why they were having such difficulty making pottery. They responded with various answers. I don't have any experience. I've never been trained, or I have no talent. Based on the result, what they said was all true. However, the most important reason for their failure was due to the clay not being centered on the wheel. The youth had thought that they had placed the clay in the center, but from a professional's perspective, it wasn't in the exact center. He then told them, let's try this one more time. This time, Elder Oba placed the clay in the exact center of the wheel and then started to turn the wheel, making a hole in the middle of the clay. Several of the youth tried again. This time, everyone started clapping when they say, wow, it's not shaking. I can do this, or I did it. Of course, the shapes weren't perfect, but the outcome was totally different than the first attempt. The reason for their success was because the clay was perfectly centered on the wheel. The world in which we live is similar to the potter's spinning wheel, and the speed of that wheel is increasing. Like the clay on the potter's wheel, we must be centered as well. Our core, the center of our lives, must be Jesus Christ and his gospel. Living a Christ-centered life means we learn about Jesus Christ and his gospel, and then we follow his example and keep his commandments with exactness. The ancient prophet Isaiah stated, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, thou art, art the potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. If our lives are centered in Jesus Christ, he can successfully mold us into who we need to be in order to return to his and Heavenly Father's presence in the celestial kingdom. The joy we experience in this life will be in direct proportion to how well our lives are centered on the teachings, example, and atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I was born into a multi-generational LDS family, so the blessings and joy of having the gospel of Jesus Christ as the basis of our family culture was woven into our everyday life. It wasn't until my full-time mission as a young man that I realized the incredibly positive impact the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ has on those who never previously experienced its blessings in their lives. This verse in Matthew reflects the process that people who are converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ experience. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let me share with you an example from the Book of Mormon that illustrates what one convert was willing to pay in order to receive the joy associated with finding the treasure spoken of by Jesus in the parable of the treasure hid in the field. Remember in the Book of Alma, chapter 20, Ammon and Lamoni were traveling to the city of Madoni for the purpose of finding and delivering Ammon's brother Aaron out of prison. During their journey, they encountered Lamoni's father, who was the Lamanite king over all the land. The king was very upset that his son Lamoni was traveling with Ammon, a Nephite missionary whom he considered an enemy. He felt his son should have attended a great feast he had sponsored for his sons and his people. 
The Lamanite king was so upset that he commanded his son Lamoni to slay Ammon with his sword. When Lamoni refused, the king drew his own sword to slay his son for disobedience. However, Ammon interceded to save Lamoni's life. He ultimately overpowered the king and could have killed him. This is what the king said to Ammon, finding himself in this life and death situation. If thou wilt spare me, I will grant unto thee whatsoever thou wilt ask, even to half of the kingdom. So the king was willing to pay the price of one half his kingdom in order to spare his own life. The king must have been astonished when Ammon requested only that he release his brother Aaron and his associates from prison and that his son Lamoni retain his kingdom. Later on, Due to this encounter, Ammon's brother Aaron was released from the Madonai prison. After his release, he was inspired to travel where the Lamanite king ruled over the land. Aaron was introduced to the king and had the privilege of teaching him the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ, including the great plan of redemption. The teachings of Aaron inspired the king deeply. The king's response to Aaron's teaching is found in verse 15 of Alma chapter 22. And it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded these things unto him, the king said, What shall I do that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit that I may be filled with joy, that I may not be cast off at the last day? Behold, said he, I will give up all that I possess. Yea, I will forsake my kingdom that I may receive this great joy. Amazingly enough, in contrast to giving up one half his kingdom to spare his life, the Lamanite king was now willing to give up his entire kingdom that he might receive the joy that comes from understanding, accepting, and living the gospel of Jesus Christ. My wife, Nancy, is also a convert to the church. She has mentioned to me many times over the years the joy she has felt in her life since finding, accepting, and living the gospel of Jesus Christ. What follows is a reflection from Sister Maines on her experience. As a young adult in my early 20s, I was at a point in my life when I knew I needed to change something in order to be a happier person. I felt like I was adrift with no real purpose and direction, and I didn't know where to go to find it. I had always known that Heavenly Father existed, and occasionally through my life it said prayers, feeling that He listened. As I began my search, I attended several different churches, but would always fall back into the same feelings and discouragement. I feel very blessed because my prayer for direction and purpose in life was ultimately answered and the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ was brought into my life. For the first time, I felt like I had a purpose and the plan of happiness brought real joy into my life. Another experience from the Book of Mormon clearly illustrates how living a Christ-centered life can fill us with great happiness even when surrounded with incredible hardships. After the prophet Lehi and his family left Jerusalem in 600 BC, they wandered approximately eight years in the wilderness until they finally arrived in a land they called Bountiful, which was near the seashore. Nephi describes their life of tribulation in the wilderness this way. We had suffered many afflictions and much difficulty, even so much that we cannot write them all. While living in Bountiful, Nephi is charged by the Lord with the responsibility to build a ship which would take them across the sea to the Promised Land. After arriving in the Promised Land, great conflicts continued to arise between the people who centered their lives in Christ and the non-believers who followed the examples of Laman and Lemuel. Ultimately, the risk of violence between the two groups was so great that Nephi and those who followed the teachings of the Lord separated themselves and fled into the wilderness for safety. At this point in time, some 30 years after Lehi and his family left Jerusalem, 
Nephi makes a well-documented and somewhat surprising statement, especially after recording in the scriptures the many afflictions and tribulations they had faced for so long. These are his words. And it came to pass that we did live after the manner of happiness. Despite their hardships, they were able to live after the manner of happiness because they were centered in Christ and his gospel. Brothers and sisters, like the clay on the potter's wheel, our lives must be centered with exactness in Christ if we are to find true joy and peace in this life. The examples of the Lamanite king, my wife Nancy, and the Nephite people all support this true principle. I bear you my witness today that we too can find that peace, that happiness, that true joy, if we choose to live Christ-centered lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. On a signal from the conductor, the congregation will stand and join the choir in singing, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. After the singing, we will hear from Sister Neil F. Marriott, second counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. She will be followed by Elders Larry R. Lawrence and Francisco J. Venus of the Seventy. Following their remarks, the choir will sing, Precious Savior, Dear Redeemer. This is the 185th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
Elder Dallin H. Oaks in April General Conference spoke of the need to reform our personal lives. I submit that personal reformation begins with a change of heart. No matter your life experiences or your place of birth, I come from the deep south of the United States, and in my youth the words of old Protestant hymns taught me of a true disciple's heart, a heart that had been changed. Consider these lyrics so dear to me. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. How do we, a modern, busy, competitive people, become yielded and still? How do we make the Lord's ways our ways? I believe that we begin by learning of Him and praying for understanding. As our trust in Him grows, we open our hearts and seek to do His will and wait for answers that will help us understand. My own change of heart started when, as a 12-year-old, I began to search for God. Other than saying the Lord's Prayer, I didn't really know how to pray. I remember kneeling, hoping I could feel His love, and asking, Where are you, Heavenly Father? I know you must be out there somewhere, but where? All through my teen years, I asked. I did have glimpses of the reality of Jesus Christ, but Heavenly Father let me, in His wisdom, seek and wait for ten years. In 1970, when the missionaries taught me about the Father's plan of salvation and of the Savior's atonement, my waiting ended. I embraced these truths and was baptized. Based on this knowledge of the Lord's mercy and power, my husband, children, and I chose this family motto, it will all work out. Yet how can we say those words to one another when deep troubles come and answers aren't readily available? <clears throat> when our delightful, worthy 21-year-old daughter, daughter, Georgia, was hospitalized in critical condition following a bike accident, our family said, it will all work out. As I flew immediately from our mission in Brazil to Indianapolis, Indiana, to be with her, I clung to our family motto. However, <coughs> our lovely daughter passed into the spirit world just hours before my plane landed. With grief and shock running like a current through our family, how could we look at one another and still say, it will all work out? Following George's mortal death, our feelings were raw. We struggled, and still today we have moments of great sorrow. But we hold to the understanding that no one ever really dies. Despite our anguish when George's physical body stopped functioning, we had faith that she went right on living as a spirit. And we believe we will live with her eternally if we adhere to our temple covenants. Faith in our Redeemer and His resurrection, faith in His priesthood power, and faith in eternal sealings, let us state our motto with conviction. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, If you do your best, it will all work out. Put your trust in God. The Lord will not forsake us. Our family motto doesn't say it will all work out now. It speaks of our hope in the eternal outcome not necessarily of present results. Scripture says, search diligently, pray always, and be believing, and all things shall work together for your good. This doesn't mean all things are good, but for the meek and faithful, things, both positive and negative, work together for good, and the timing is the Lord's. We wait on Him. Sometimes, like Job in his suffering, knowing that God maketh sore and bindeth up, he woundeth and his hands make whole. A meek heart accepts the trial and the waiting for that time of healing and wholeness to come. When we open ourselves to the Spirit, we learn God's way and feel His will. During the sacrament, 
which I call the heart of the Sabbath, I have found that after praying for forgiveness of sins, it is instructive for me to ask Heavenly Father, Father, is there more? When we are yielded and still, our minds can be directed to something more we may need to change, something limiting our capacity to receive spiritual guidance or even healing and help. For example, perhaps I have a carefully guarded resentment towards someone. When I ask if there is more to confess, that secret comes clearly to my memory. In essence, the Holy Ghost is whispering, You honestly asked if there were more, and here it is. Your resentment diminishes your progress and damages your ability to have healthy relationships. You can let this go. Oh, it is hard work. We may feel quite justified in our animosity, but yielding to the Lord's way is the only way to lasting happiness. In time and by degrees, we receive His gracious strength and direction, perhaps leading us to frequent the temple or to study more deeply the Savior's Atonement or to consult with a friend, a bishop, a professional counselor, or even a doctor. The healing of our heart begins when we submit to and worship God. True worship begins when our hearts are right before the Father and the Son. What is our heart condition today? Paradoxically, in order to have a healed and faithful heart, we must first allow it to break before the Lord. Ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit, the Lord declares. The result of sacrificing our heart or our will to the Lord is that we receive the spiritual guidance we need. With a growing understanding of the Lord's grace and mercy, we will find that our self-willed hearts begin to crack and break in gratitude. Then we reach for Him, yearning to yoke ourselves to the only begotten Son of God. In our broken-hearted reaching and yoking, we receive new hope and fresh guidance through the Holy Ghost. I have struggled to banish the mortal desire to have things my way eventually realizing that my way is oh so lacking, limited, and inferior to the way of Jesus Christ. His way is the path that leads to happiness in this life and eternal life in the world to come. Can we love Jesus Christ and His way more than we love ourselves and our own agenda? Some may think they have failed too many times and feel too weak to change sinful acts or worldly desires of the heart. However, as covenant Israel, we don't just try and try on our own to change. If we earnestly appeal to God, He takes us as we are and makes us more than we ever imagined. Noted theologian Robert L. Millett writes of a healthy longing to improve, balanced with the spiritual assurance that in and through Jesus Christ, we are going to make it. With such an understanding, we can honestly say to Heavenly Father, so trusting my all to thy tender care and knowing thou lovest me, I'll do thy will with a heart sincere, I'll be what you want me to be. When we offer our broken heart to Jesus Christ, He accepts our offering. He takes us back. No matter what losses, wounds, and rejection we may have suffered, His grace and healing are mightier than all. Truly, yoked to the Savior, we can say with confidence, it will all work out. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. When I was a young adult, I began investigating the Church. At first, I was drawn to the gospel by the examples of my Latter-day Saint friends, but eventually I was attracted to the unique doctrine. When I learned that faithful men and women 
could keep progressing and ultimately become like our heavenly parents, I was frankly amazed. I loved the concept. It rang true to me. Soon after my baptism, I was studying the Sermon on the Mount, and I recognized that Jesus taught this same truth about eternal progression in the Bible. He said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I have been a member now for over 40 years, and whenever I read this verse of Scripture, I am reminded of our purpose here on earth. We came to learn and improve until we gradually become sanctified or perfected in Christ. The journey of discipleship is not an easy one. It has been called a course of steady improvement. As we travel along the straight and narrow path, the Spirit continually challenges us to be better and to climb higher. The Holy Ghost makes an ideal traveling companion. If we are humble and teachable, He will take us by the hand and lead us home. However, we need to ask the Lord for directions along the way. We have to ask some difficult questions. Questions like, what do I need to change? How can I improve? What weakness needs strengthening? Let's consider the New Testament account of the rich young ruler. He was a righteous young man who was already keeping the Ten Commandments, but he wanted to become better. His goal was eternal life. When he met the Savior, he asked, What lack I yet? Jesus answered immediately, giving counsel that was intended specifically for the rich young man. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come and follow me. The young man was stunned. He had never considered such a sacrifice. He was humble enough to ask the Lord, but not faithful enough to follow the divine counsel he was given. We must be willing to act when we receive an answer. President Harold B. Lee taught, Every one of us, if we would reach perfection, must at one time ask ourselves this question, What lack I yet? I knew a faithful mother who humbled herself and asked, What is keeping me from progressing? In her case, the response from the Spirit came immediately, Stop complaining. This answer surprised her. She had never thought of herself as a complainer. However, the message from the Holy Ghost was very clear. In the days that followed, she became conscious of her habit of complaining. Grateful for the prompting to improve, she determined to count her blessings instead of her challenges. Within days, she felt the warm approval of the Spirit. A humble young man who couldn't seem to find the right girl went to the Lord for help. What is keeping me from being the right man? he asked. This answer came into his heart and his mind. Clean up your language. At that moment, he realized that several crude expressions had become a part of his vocabulary, and he committed to change. A single sister asked the question, What do I need to change? And the Spirit whispered to her, Don't interrupt people when they are talking. The Holy Ghost really does give customized counsel. <laughs> he is a completely honest companion and will tell us things that no one else knows or has the courage to say. One return missionary found himself stressed with a very heavy schedule. He was trying to find time for work, studies, family, and a church calling. He asked the Lord for counsel. How can I feel at peace with all that I need to do? The answer was not what he expected. He received the impression that he should more carefully observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. He decided to dedicate Sunday to God's service and to lay aside his school courses on that day and study the gospel instead. This small adjustment brought the peace and balance that he was seeking. Years ago, I read in a church magazine the story of a girl who was living away from home and going to college. She was behind in her classes, her social life was not what she had hoped for, and she was generally unhappy. Finally, one day, she fell to her knees and cried out, What can I do to improve my life? The Holy Ghost whispered, Get up and clean your room. <laughs> this prompting came as a complete surprise, but it was just the start she needed. 
After taking time to organize and put things in order, she felt the Spirit fill the room and lift her heart. The Holy Ghost doesn't tell us to improve everything at once. If He did, we would become discouraged and give up. The Spirit works with us at our own speed, one step at a time, or as the Lord has taught, line upon line, precept upon precept, and blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts, for unto him that receiveth I will give more. For example, if the Holy Ghost has been prompting you to say thank you more often and you respond to that prompting, then he may feel it's time for you to move on to something more challenging, like learning to say, I'm sorry, that was my fault. A perfect time to ask what lack I yet is when we take the sacrament. The Apostle Paul taught that this is a time for each of us to examine ourselves. In this reverent atmosphere, as our thoughts are turned heavenward, the Lord can gently tell us what we need to work on next. Like you, I have received many messages from the Spirit over the years showing me how I could improve. Let me share a, a few personal examples of messages that I took to heart. These promptings have included, don't raise your voice, organize yourself, create a daily list of things to do, take better care of your body by eating more fruits and vegetables, increase your temple attendance, take time to ponder before you pray, ask your wife for her counsel, and be patient when driving, don't exceed the speed limit. I'm still working on that last one. <laughs> the atoning sacrifice of the Savior is what makes perfection or sanctification possible. We could never do it on our own, but God's grace is sufficient to help us. As Elder David A. Bednar once observed, most of us clearly understand that the atonement of Christ is for sinners. I am not so sure, however, that we know and understand that the atonement is also for saints for good men and women who are obedient, worthy, and conscientious, and who are striving to become better." End of quote. I would like to suggest that each of you participate in a spiritual exercise sometime soon, perhaps even tonight while saying your prayers. Humbly ask the Lord the following question, what is keeping me from progressing? In other words, what lack I yet? Then wait quietly for a response. If you are sincere, the answer will soon become clear. It will be revelation intended just for you. Perhaps the Spirit will tell you to, to, that you need to forgive someone, or you may receive a message to be more selective about the movies you watch or the music you listen to. You may feel impressed to be more honest in your business dealings or more generous in your fast offerings. The possibilities are endless. The Spirit can show us our weaknesses, but He is also able to show us our strengths. Sometimes we need to ask what we are doing right so that the Lord can lift and encourage us. When we read our patriarchal blessings, we are reminded that our Heavenly Father knows our divine potential. He rejoices every time we take a step forward. To Him, our direction is ever more important than our speed. Be persistent, brothers and sisters, but never be discouraged. We will have to go beyond the grave before we actually reach perfection. But here in mortality, we can lay the foundation. It is our duty to be better today than we were yesterday and better tomorrow than we are today. If spiritual growth is not a priority in our lives, if we are not on a course of steady improvement, we will miss out on the important experiences that God wants to give us. Years ago, I read these words of President Spencer W. Kimball, which had a lasting impact on me. He said, I have learned that where there is a prayerful heart, a hungering after righteousness, a forsaking of sins, and obedience to the commandments of God, the Lord pours out more and more light until there is finally power to pierce the heavenly veil. A person of such righteousness has the priceless promise that one day he shall see the Lord's face and know that he is." End of quote. It is my prayer that this ultimate experience can be ours someday as we allow the Holy Ghost to lead us home. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Many of us who are meeting to participate in this conference have come to hear the pleasing word of God, yea, the word which healeth the wounded soul. That word can be found in the scriptures and in the messages from our leaders, bringing us hope and comfort in the darkness of affliction. For our experience in life, we learn that joy in this world is not full, but in Jesus Christ, our joy is full. He will give us strength so we will not have to suffer any manner of afflictions, save they are swallowed up in his joy. Our hearts can be filled with anguish when we see a loved one suffer the pains of a horrible disease. The death of someone we love can leave an empty place in our soul. When some of our children stray from the gospel path, we may feel guilt and uncertainty about their eternal destiny. The hope of achieving a celestial marriage and establishing a family in this life can begin to fade as time goes by. Abuse by those who are supposed to love us can leave deeply painful marks in our soul. The infidelity of a spouse can destroy a relationship that we hope would be eternal. This and many other afflictions inherent to this provisionary state sometimes cause us to ask ourselves the same question that the prophet Joseph Smith asked. Oh God, where art thou? In those difficult moments in our lives, the pleasing word of God that heals the wounded soul brings the following message of comfort to our heart and mind. Peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. And then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. The pleasing word of God fills us with hope, knowing that those who are faithful in tribulation will have the greater reward in the kingdom of heaven, and that after much tribulation come the blessings. The pleasing word of God, as spoken through the prophets, gives us the security that our eternal sealing, sustained by our faithfulness to the divine promise that we were given for our valiant service in the cause of truth, will bless us and our posterity. They also give us the security that after we have lived a faithful life, we will not lose any blessing for not having done certain things if we were never given the opportunity to do them. If we have lived faithful until the time of our death, we will have all the blessings, exaltation, and glory that any man or woman who has had that opportunity will have. Now, it is important to understand that some suffering and affliction can also enter our lives if we fail to truly repent of our sins. President Marion G. Romney taught, quote, the suffering and distress endured by people of this earth is the result of unrepented and unremitted sin. Just as suffering and sorrow attend sin, so happiness and joy attend forgiveness of sins. Why does lack of repentance cause suffering and pain? One of the possible answers is that a punishment was affixed and a just law given, which brought about remorse of conscience. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that we are the ones who condemn ourselves and that it is the torment of disappointment in our mind that makes it as intense as a burning lake of fire and brimstone. If we attempt to appease our conscience by trying to excuse ourselves in the least point because of our sins, or by trying to hide them, the only thing we will accomplish is to offend the Spirit and delay our repentance. This type of relief, besides being temporary, will ultimately bring more pain and grief into our lives and will diminish our possibility of receiving a remission of our sins. For this type of suffering, 
the pleasing word of God also brings comfort and hope. It tells us that there is relief from the pain caused by the effects of sin. This relief comes from the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and takes effect if we exercise faith in him, repent, and are obedient to his commandments. It is important that we realize that just like the remission of sins, repentance is a process and not something that happens at one particular moment. It requires consistency in each of its steps. For example, when we partake of the sacrament, we show the Lord that we are going to remember him always and keep his commandments. That is an expression of our sincere intent. The moment that we begin to remember him and keep his commandments every day, and not just on the Sabbath day, is when the remission of our sins begin to gradually take effect and his promise of having his spirit with us begins to be fulfilled. Without the proper obedience that must accompany our intent, the effect of remissions may disappear before long and the companionship of the Spirit begins to withdraw. We will run the risk of honoring Him with our lips while removing our hearts from Him. In addition to comfort, the pleasing Word of God warns us that this process of receiving our remission of our sins can be interrupted when we become entangled in the vanities of the world. And it can be resumed through faith if we sincerely repent and humble ourselves. What might be some of those vanities that can interfere in the process of receiving a remission of our sins and that are associated with keeping the Sabbath day holy? Some examples include arriving late for sacrament meeting without a valid reason, arriving without previously having examined ourselves to eat the bread and drink from the cup worthily, and arriving without first having confessed our sins and having asked God for forgiveness for them. Other examples, being irreverent by exchanging messages on our electronic devices, leaving the meeting after partaking of the sacrament, and engaging in activities in our homes that are inappropriate for that sacred day. What might be one of the reasons why we, knowing all these things, often fail to keep the Sabbath day holy? In the book of Isaiah, we can find an answer that through related to the Sabbath also applies to other commandments that we must keep. If thou turn away thy food from Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. The key words are turn away from doing thy pleasure, or in other words, doing God's will. Oftentimes, our will shaped by the desires, appetites, and passions of the natural man conflicts with the will of God. The prophet Brigham Young taught that, quote, when the will, passions, and feelings of a person are perfectly submissive to God and his requirements, that person is sanctified. It is for my will to be swallowed up in the will of God. That will lead me into all good and crown me with ultimately with immortality and eternal lives." End of quote. The pleasing word of God invites us to use the power of the atonement of Christ to apply it to ourselves and become reconciled with his will and not with the will of the devil and the flesh. So we, through his grace, can be saved. The pleasing word of God that we share today shows us that need of continuous repentance in our lives so we can keep the influence of the Holy Ghost for as long as possible. Having the companionship of the Spirit will make us better people. It will whisper peace and joy to our souls. 
it will take malice, hatred, envy, strife, and all evil from our hearts. And our whole desire will be to do good, bring forth righteousness, and build up the kingdom of God. With the influence of the Holy Ghost, we will not be offended, nor will we offend others. We will feel happier, and our minds will be cleaner. Our love for others will increase. We will be more willing to forgive and spread happiness to those around us. We will feel grateful to see how others progress, and we will seek the good in others. It is my prayer that we might experience the joy that comes from striving to live in righteousness, and that we may keep the companionship of the Holy Ghost in our lives through sincere and continuous repentance. We will become better people, and our families will be blessed. Of these principles, I testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
we express gratitude to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Come, Come Ye Saints. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Adrian Achoa of the Seventy. The prophet Lehi declared, If there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. The adversary has been successful in planting a great myth in the minds of many people. He and his emissaries declare, that the real choice we have is between happiness and pleasure now in this life and happiness in a life to come, which the adversary asserts may not exist. This myth is a false choice, but it is very seductive. The ultimate noble purpose of God's plan of happiness is for righteous disciples and covenant families to be united in love, harmony and peace in this life and attain celestial glory in the eternities with God the Father, our Creator, and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. When I was a young missionary assigned to the British Mission, my first area of labor was in what was then the Bristol District. One of the local church leaders emphasized that missionaries serving in that area needed to be ship shape and Bristol fashion. Initially, I didn't understand the point he was making. I soon learned the history of the nautical phrase ship shape and Bristol fashion. At one time, Bristol was the second busiest port in the United Kingdom. It had a very high tidal range of 43 feet, the second highest in the world. At low tide, when the water receded, the old ships would hit bottom and fall on their sides. And if the ships were not well built, they would be damaged. In addition, everything that was not carefully stowed away or tied down would be thrown in a chaotic fashion and ruined or spoiled. After I understood what that phrase meant, it was clear that this leader was telling us that as missionaries, we must be righteous, follow rules, and be prepared for difficult situations. This same challenge is applicable to each of us. I would describe being shipshape and Bristol fashion as being temple-worthy in good times and in bad times. While the fluctuation of the tide in the Bristol Channel is somewhat predictable and can be prepared for, the storms and temptations of this life are often unpredictable. But this we know, they will come. In order to overcome the challenges and temptations that each of us inevitably face, it will require righteous preparation and the use of divinely provided protections. We must determine to be temple-worthy regardless of what befalls us. If we are prepared, we shall not fear. Happiness in this life and happiness in the life to come are interconnected by righteousness. Even in the period between death and the resurrection, the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace. At the commencement of the Savior's earthly ministry in Israel and later among the Nephites, the Savior addressed the issue of happiness both in this life and in eternity. He stressed ordinances, but he also placed great emphasis on moral behavior. For example, disciples would be blessed if they would hunger and thirst after righteousness, be merciful, be pure in heart, be peacemakers, and follow other basic moral principles. Clearly, as a foundational doctrinal message, our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized both righteous attitudes and conduct in day-to-day -day living. His teachings not only replaced and transcended elements of the Law of Moses, but also were a rejection of the false philosophies of men. 
For many centuries, the gospel of Jesus Christ has inspired beliefs and established standards of conduct as to what is righteous, desirable, and moral, and results in happiness, felicity, and joy. However, the principles and basic morality the Savior taught are under serious attack in today's world. Christianity is under attack. Many believe that what is moral has basically changed. We live in difficult times. There is an increased tendency to call evil good and good evil. A world that emphasizes self-aggrandizement and secularism is cause for great concern. One prominent writer, not of our faith, has put it this way. Unfortunately, I see little evidence that people are actually happier in the emerging dispensation, or that their children are better off, or that the cause of social justice is well served, or that declining marriage rates and thinning family trees promise anything save greater loneliness for the majority and stagnation overall. As disciples of the Savior, we are expected to plan and prepare. In the plan of happiness, moral agency is a central organizing principle, and our choices matter. The Savior emphasized this throughout His ministry, including His parables of the foolish virgins and the talents. In each of these, the Lord commended preparation and action and condemned procrastination and idleness. I recognize that despite the overwhelming happiness embodied in God's divine plan, sometimes it can feel far away and disconnected from our current circumstances. It may feel beyond our reach as struggling disciples. From our limited perspective, current temptations and distractions can seem attractive. The rewards for resisting those temptations, on the other hand, can feel distant and unattainable. But a true understanding of the Father's plan reveals that the rewards of righteousness are available right now. Wickedness, such as immoral conduct, is never part of the answer. Alma said it clearly to his son Corianton, Behold, I say unto you, wickedness never was happiness. Our doctrine is clearly stated by Amulek in Alma 34 and 32. Behold, this life is the time to prepare for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. How then do we prepare in such a difficult time? In addition to being temple worthy, there are many principles that contribute to righteousness. I will emphasize three. First, righteous self-control and conduct. I believe that sometimes our loving Father in heaven must view us with the amusement we feel when we watch our own small children as they learn and grow. We all stumble and fall as we gain experience. I appreciated the conference address President Dieter F. Uchtdorf gave in 2010 about the famous marshmallow experiment conducted at Stanford University in the 1960s. You'll remember that four-year-olds were given a single marshmallow. If they could wait for 15 or 20 minutes without eating it, they would receive a second marshmallow. Videos have been produced showing the contortions that many children used to avoid eating the marshmallow. Some did not succeed. Last year, the professor who conducted the original experiment, Dr. Walter Michelle, wrote a book in which he said the study grew in part out of his concerns about self-control and his own addiction to smoking. He was particularly concerned after the U.S. Surgeon General's report of 1964 concluded that smoking caused lung cancer. Based on years of study, one of his professional colleagues reported that self-control is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. Avoiding something tempting once will help you develop the ability to resist other temptations in the future. A principle of eternal progression is that exercising self-control and living righteously strengthens our ability to resist temptation. This is true both in the spiritual realm and in temporal matters. Our missionaries are an, an excellent example. They develop Christ-like attributes and emphasize obedience and spirituality. They are expected to adhere to a rigorous schedule and spend their days in the service of others. 
They have a modest, conservative appearance instead of the casual or immodest manner of dress so prevalent today. Their conduct and appearance convey a moral, serious message. We have approximately 230,000 young people who are currently serving as missionaries or who have returned from missionary service in the last five years. They have developed remarkable spiritual strength and self-discipline that needs to be continually exercised or these qualities will atrophy, just like the muscles that are not used. All of us need to develop and demonstrate conduct and appearance that declare we are true followers of Christ. Those who abandon either righteous conduct or a wholesome, modest appearance expose themselves to lifestyles that bring neither joy nor happiness. The restored gospel gives us the blueprint of the plan of happiness and an incentive to understand and exercise self-control and avoid temptation. It also teaches us how to repent when violations have occurred. Second, honoring the Sabbath will increase righteousness and be a protection for the family. The early Christian church changed observance of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday to commemorate the Lord's resurrection. Other basic sacred purposes of the Sabbath remained unchanged. For Jews and Christians, the Sabbath symbolizes the mighty works of God. My wife and I and two of my colleagues and their wives recently participated in a Jewish Shabbat at the invitation of a dear friend, Robert Abrams and his wife Diane in their New York home. It commenced at the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath on a Friday evening. The focus was honoring God as the creator. It began by blessing the family and a, same, and a Sabbath hymn. We joined in the ceremonial washing of hands, the blessing of the bread, the prayers, the kosher meal, the recitation of scripture, and singing Sabbath songs in a celebratory mood. We listened to the Hebrew words following along with English translations. The most poignant scriptures read from the Old Testament, which are also dear to us, were from Isaiah, declaring the Sabbath a delight, and from Ezekiel that the Sabbath shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. The overwhelming impression from this wonderful evening was a family love, devotion, and accountability to God. As I thought about this event, I reflected on the extreme persecution that the Jews have experienced over centuries. Clearly, honoring the Sabbath has been a perpetual covenant preserving and blessing the Jewish people in fulfillment of scripture. It has also contributed to the extraordinary family life and happiness that is evident in the lives of many Jewish people. For members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, honoring the Sabbath is a form of righteousness that will bless and strengthen families, connect us with our Creator, and increase happiness. The Sabbath can help separate us from that which is frivolous, inappropriate, or immoral. It allows us to be in the world, but not of the world. In the last six months, the most remarkable change has occurred in the church. This has been in the response of the members to renewed emphasis on the Sabbath by the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and to President Russell M. Nelson's challenge to make the Sabbath a delight. Many members understand that truly keeping the Sabbath day holy is a refuge from the storms of this life. It is also a sign of our devotion to our Father in Heaven and an increased understanding of the sacredness of sacrament meeting. Still, we have a long way to go, but we have a wonderful beginning. I challenge all of us to continue to embrace this council and improve our Sabbath worship. Third, divine protections are provided when we are righteous. As part of God's divine plan, we are blessed with the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift is the right to have, whenever one is worthy, the companionship of the Holy Ghost. This member of the Godhead serves as a cleansing agent if the gospel is first in our lives. He also is a voice of warning against evil and a voice of protection against danger. As we navigate the seas of life, following the impressions of the Holy Ghost is essential. The Spirit will help us avoid temptations and dangers and comfort and lead us through challenges. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Adherence to sacred gospel principles will allow us to be temple-worthy, find happiness in this life, and lead us back to our heavenly home. My dear brothers and sisters, life is not easy, nor was it meant to be. It is a time of testing and trial. Like the old ships in Bristol Harbor, there will be times when the tide goes out, and it seems as if everything in this world keeping us afloat disappears. We may hit the bottom and even be tipped over on our sides. Amid such trials, I promise you that living and maintaining temple-worthy lives will hold together all that really matters. The sweet blessings of peace, happiness, and joy, along with the blessings of eternal life and celestial glory with our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, will be realized. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our dear and beloved Heavenly Father, we love Thee, and we love Thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Our hearts are full of joy because of this beautiful music and because of words of wisdom and redemption that we receive with full hearts and gratitude. We implore, Heavenly Father, that we might apply those words in our lives and become better children of Thy. We pray that we can share the gospel of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, with those that we love. And we pray for these things humbly in that name of Thy Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 185th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.